Hi everyone. Cool. So uh, let's talk about how this happened. Uh, this was supposed to be a talk on machine learning. Speaking of the talk selection process, I told the committee um, that we uh, YouTube was working on machine learning. We definitely have some interesting things to share. Um, we didn't know what they would be at the time that talk selection happened. Um, and so uh, Matt said, that's OK. I'll just put you at the end and say something light, keep it easy, make sure to humiliate yourself. Um, so we're going to go with that. Uh, this talk is not the talk that I expected to be giving. Uh, it is not even the talk that I would say I'd want to be giving, but it is the data that we have. Uh, also, I will be filling in anyone's bingo card as best I can. <laughs> So if you uh, have your buzzwords uh, ready. Um, the first part, completely irrelevant to machine learning, um, our AV1 update. We are serving AV1 in production today at about a gigabit per second. We're hoping to scale that up pretty rapidly. We project we'll be at a terabit per second by the end of the month. This is still a pretty small fraction of YouTube's egress. Um, but it is a sign that like this is working for us in production. Um, it's not a cost-effective choice at this time. Um, we're doing this mostly to make sure that people know that we are deadly serious about AV1 and are committed to its success. Um, so that's the good news. Um, now let's actually talk about machine learning. Um, what I was hoping to be able to present was that we would re had replaced all of ABR with a machine learned solution that did everything perfectly. Um, and as you can imagine, that didn't actually work out. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is you have to give machine learning an objective function. And for us, objective functions are watch time. That's our, our real thing that we try to optimize for is user happiness, but it's extremely difficult to measure that on the fly. So we use engagement as a proxy for that with a bunch of safety valves to make sure that we're not abusing people's time or um, going down bad paths. Uh, uh, so we use engagement as a metric, but engagement is really challenging to understand because YouTube competes with itself continuously. So um, on a watch page, users have a lot of different ways to exit a video, for instance. Very rarely will that actually be related to a rebuffer or a network event. So we have a, a wide open playing field of reasons that users could abandon. Um, it's difficult to build a model on that. So what we try to do when we're doing modeling exercises is train on proxy metrics, individual playbacks, individual features. Um, but these tend to go catastrophically wrong in a playback environment as complex as YouTube. Um, so uh, for instance, like if you train an algorithm to only optimize against MTBR, uh, mean time between rebuffers, uh, then uh, it'll obviously only choose 144p because that's the best format. So building a overall system that looks at every one of our proxy metrics is even, no, uh, we're not there yet. Um, we are working to improve those proxy metrics. Um, one technique that you should write down is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve search sensor data sets. This is a technique that comes from medical science, helps us build a more robust sessionized metric. It would be a whole separate talk, so I'm not going to go into it here. Um, but uh, using a technique like VMAF, um, but for uh, quality of service metrics would be another interesting approach. Um, uh, we haven't done it yet. Um, we would like to. But uh, that is only one reason that building an overall replacement is hard. Another reason is uh, Google actually has really high standards. We're really enthusiastic about ABR, but we have really high standards for it. Um, we have our publicly, proposed, uh, publicly posted um, uh, AI policy that uh, says has a bunch of rigorous requirements about not being able to harm diverse populations, um, making sure AIs are unbiased. And it's really hard to clear that bar, especially when you're replacing an entire product. Um, there's also the fact that YouTube is stupidly complicated. Um, uh, we have a lot of sub products, and they. <laughs> Uh, this is a tiny fraction of the apps available. Um, this is not even like each feature category. Um, so being able to have all of these products leads you to some interesting places, especially when you have relatively small volume in a large data set. So when you're trying to launch a new feature like VR, um, then you end up in a place where you need to make changes specific to VR, such as boosting the resolution cap and, and biasing more towards resolution over rebuffer rate, ac accepting more rebuffers for higher resolution. Um, and those changes are difficult to make in an overall model. Uh, there's also the case that YouTube's actually been around for a while, and our players have had a ton of investment in them. So their engineering is pretty good. Um, we find it difficult to beat that 
on an overall basis. So for all of these reasons, we've decided instead to produce, uh, pursue a tool-based approach um, where uh, what we do is we separate each of our, we're, our, uh, our players are each engineered on a specific platform today. Um, but what we're doing is we are splitting those players, we're like going back and, and actually documenting what they do because they grew organically over time. Um, for each component that we pull out, we write a rigid specification. Um, we unify their implementations because usually they're not exactly the same across clients. And this is important because otherwise machine learning might be picking the same parameter sets, experiencing a variation, and then adapting to them based on a mix of factors of like the combination of app usage in a particular region or on a particular network. Um, as opposed to the network characteristics itself. So making sure the implementations are consistent um, unifies the, the approach that we take when we actually learn a tool. Um, then we build a, uh, a, a, a TensorFlow is our, is our chosen framework. Um, what we found is that you don't actually have to use machine learning to use TensorFlow. Um, we just use it as a configuration language, essentially, um, as, a, as a first step. Um, and then actually you kick off traditional machine learning for individual sub-features, which is a lot easier than a whole algorithm because you can identify just the part that they're supposed to affect in order to build your loss functions. Um, now our goal is, of course, to pick the parts that have the most leverage. Um, and here's where the talk that I was planning to give really went off the rails because even though what we thought, uh, even though like we're finding some inspiration in the traditional category. So for instance, um, a WaveNet-based approach. WaveNet's a Google speech synthesis algorithm. And um, you can take parts of it to be able to build a bandwidth estimation thing. Well, this bandwidth estimation, we knew that we could always do better with bandwidth estimation. Everybody can always do better with bandwidth estimation. Um, so this seems like a really obvious place for us to start. And we are like making incremental improvements um, but nothing like hugely compelling, nothing enough that I'd actually want to stand up here and explain it all to you because we haven't like nailed anything next generational with it. Um, and that's similar about like the architecture of the machine learning approaches that we're using is um, when we think about like there's no principled approach at, at present. We use a mix of like edge compute, which is pretty cool, and we do client side stuff and traditional server side estimation, but there's like there's not anything really interesting there because it's mostly not embarrassing and not revolutionary. So um, let's talk about something that is. This is an audience participation moment. Um, so I'm going to count one, two, three, and then on three, I want everyone to gasp in horror, like a <gasps> You ready? One, two, video quality, it doesn't matter. Three. I know, right? <laughs> so uh, here's how I proved this. This is part of our machine learning feeder information. As I started an experiment on the desktop player, which is what I mostly code in, if I code it at all anymore these days. Um, I started an experiment where I capped everybody by default to 480p. You go, 10, you go full screen on a 1080p screen, you go full, full screen on a 4K screen, you'd still only get 480p. We saw no negative results on a product basis, <laughs> except for a tiny 3% increase in the rate of people upgrading their resolution using the manual quality selector. This shocked me. I am so certain that video quality matters to my own consumption experience. I was blown away by this number. There's actually, there's a small increase in some like older OS's on desktop where um, people uh, were actually getting a, a better Im Im experience because their decoders couldn't handle 720p in real time and we weren't falling back um, to lower resolutions fast enough. Now depending where you fall on the cynical to cinephile spectrum, this result may surprise you, or it may not. And yes, I'm fully aware that you can be both at the same time. Um, but uh, there are a few context pieces that I should explain to you to give you a, full, a more complete picture of this. Um, one of the things is sticky quality. So this is the thing in YouTube where if you are on in a 480p window on your web page and you choose 1080p quality anyway, for that playback, we lock you to 1080p. But for the next playback, 
what we would normally do is use 480p because that's the resolution of your window as the new quality cap, and then ABR to any resolution up to that. Because you've told us you want 1080p, we just use 1080p again whenever it's available. So we'll go up to that. Now, of course, the product's way more complicated than that because YouTube's an old product and we've tweaked the heck out of everything that we do. Um, but this system was still in place for the default quality cap experiments. Um, and uh, that meant that actually a full 10% of our user base accounting for a full 25% of watch time was exempt from the quality caps that they had done. So what I'm saying in effect is not that video quality doesn't matter, but that the people who had not already told us that video quality was important to them by using the manual quality selector were completely unaffected by a reduction in their video quality. Now, of course, the reduction was only to 480p, which is not the most, the worst experience that you can imagine. Um, but uh, the idea is that users had actually completely and accurately segmented themselves into two categories, which kind of seemed unbelievable. Nothing is that clean in real life. So we ran some follow-up studies. One follow-up study said, okay, maybe people, maybe sticky quality is the wrong mechanism, maybe this is broken. Um, so what we did is we had, for any given user in an experiment, we gave them a one in 64 chance of breaking their sticky quality setting so that they were on a playback had selected 1080p a while ago, the next playback would only go up to 480p. And it turns out that this caused an instant increase larger than the number of playbacks that we broke because users actually ended up after not only immediately selecting the quality that they wanted on that playback um, to upgrade back to the resolution that they preferred, um, they did it on subsequent playbacks as well because they had immediately lost trust in our quality selector as a result of this, uh, this experiment. Um, so it's clear that the users who care, care very much. So any change in quality for those users is extremely perceptible. And the fact that we saw no change in engagement metrics for the other users who hadn't been exempted from that, uh, it really did kind of suggest that users on desktop neatly segmented themselves into either I care about quality and I use the quality selector, or I don't and don't. Um, this still blows my mind and I'm still unsure of the result, but let's assume that it's true for now. How does this extend to other environments? Um, mobile in particular, uh, obviously this is like, uh, TV is a very different world, but um, mobile is the uh, uh, place where we see the most watch time, so it's the place that we're most interested in right now um, as an organization. And so here's another participation moment, last one of the day, I promise. Um, but if you have your laptop in front of you, um, you can do this. If not, you can use one of these screens. But just take your phone and size it up. So I know we all know about like foveal distance and how that affects video quality and video perception. Um, but it's instructive to actually do the exercise of finding the place where your phone completely covers your screen. And it is closer to your face than you might imagine. Um, the crazier thing is if you turn it so you watch it in portrait, as many people do in their videos, and then find that same distance, you actually can't. Your nose gets in the way <laughs> um, because of the interocular distance to cover both eyes. So the, uh, the differences on a phone environment are very real. Um, another consideration when applying this information to a phone context is that uh, we actually have, going the other way, we have a, um, a negative incentive to serve quality, is it actually costs users something in a lot of cases. Um, and so uh, we have a responsibility to do that. On the other hand, there are two factors that may, would make us want to make sure to always send high quality to phones. One of those is that um, the current mobile selector requires three taps to get there, which is so painful that I didn't even bother to draw it. Three taps is impossible for most people. Um, and it's relatively hidden, so uh, this is not a reliable signal, not nearly as reliable on desktop, um, where uh, the, the mouse and the position of the UI makes it more obvious. Um, another component is that people often pay for HD premium data plans. And if we are filtering everybody to a low quality by default and only making high quality opt-in, um, then we're ignoring their, their preferences for higher quality expressed through their data plan purchases, even if they didn't do it on a phone. So this is kind of an ethical dilemma, which made us think, hmm, what a great time for machine learning. Because machine learning solves ethical dilemmas, right? <laughs> um, this is, uh, 
in a way it does though, right? Because it can actually get you out of this pickle of um, how do you personalize the playback experience in a way that's more respectful. And so what we tried to do uh, is we tried to unify information about the content that users are watching, about the viewing environment that users are watching it in, and about non-demographic details about the user's activity on YouTube, the stuff that they've watched before, whether or not they used a manual quality selection, are they watching a bunch of 4K HDR videos in the past? Those kinds of things think, we think builds a, a non-discriminatory picture of a user's perception, ability, and, and affinity towards quality. Um, and we use this to sort of balance, with, uh, uh, particularly on mobile, the user's data costs and the user's sensitivity to quality. Um, and the question is, does that work? Does that result in any improvements? And oh my goodness, it does. Wow. Um, it is saving us something like 25% of our egress for those customers, which is, of course, saving them 25% of their data plans and producing double, oh, sorry, single digits, but single whole digit uh, percentage increases in engagement, um, mostly from users' data plans not running out, which, you know, on the one hand is obvious, but on the other hand is kind of a shocking result. Um, and the idea that users might not want to pay for quality at every second is not a particularly radical one, um, but it still kind of sent me into a tailspin for a while, which I'm going to ignore except for a couple slides that help fill in the bingo sheets because I had to pull most of them. Um, one is this one found a really long excuse to say the word disrupt on there. So if you're looking for disrupt, also here's a 5G phone. <laughs> um, the, whole, the whole sequence of this like exotic mental breakdown was like uh, this slide, which I'm not really sure what it means. But in the end, I, I sort of realized that like a lot of us are in entertainment businesses. Um, this is a shot from um, uh, I Pet My Dog, which if you haven't seen that YouTube video, you should watch that YouTube video. Um, and the uh, ideas that we have a, a, an affinity or a responsibility to deliver the utmost quality um, may actually be counterproductive. Because to me, I'm obsessed with quality. Um, like new TV every year, absolutely need the best of everything. Um, will not watch a video on YouTube unless it's in 4K. Like, I care about quality a lot. And a lot of the people I work with um, and actually socialize with, honestly, also care about video quality. But I think in my own bubble, the thing that machine learning, weirdly, um, showed me was that, uh, that I was actually too focused on my own experience to see that the trade-offs that we were making um, at, a, at a video company were not beneficial for the average user. Um, because the people that, who would complain to me were always so focused on quality specifically that um, uh, the, the feedback I would get was all positive for quality. But there was basically nobody saying, I don't care about quality. Because of course, if you don't care about quality, you're not going to talk to me about it. Um, so this is an, a contentious result. And I honestly want you to come up and prove to me with data that I'm wrong, because I don't particularly care for this result. I'd rather actually know um, uh, that everybody needs quality at every second of the day, because this is more consistent with the way that I think. Um, but let's take, for, uh, take a moment to accept that this is true, that most of the user population actually doesn't care about video quality. Some of the user population really cares about video quality. There may be a set of users in between that have an eh affiliation with video quality. They might notice if it's there, um, and they might, uh, uh, they might adjust their expectations or feelings toward a product mildly, but certainly not enough to you know, rotate a phone or tap a, uh, on three buttons in order to get a higher quality experience. Um, so what would we do? Um, we design different product UXs for that experience. If quality is such a bifurcating event, um, if it's uh, a fungible good rather than something that you would always want within the limits of, say, your data plan, or if you're on a desktop, um, then the limits of your computer, then the idea that we can choose the right quality for you um, based on things like the resolution of your window doesn't seem as fair because um, the right quality for an individual is actually much more of a subjective experience. It's personalized. Um, and for some users, it's always 
much higher than your window resolution because you want the highest bit rate. You actually crave those downsampling artifacts. Um, and for other users, it just like, doesn't matter. Um, and if that's true, then actually we change what we're doing as a whole. Well, I mean, there's one track in which we don't, and that's for the high quality, high fidelity desiring users, people who want exactly the creator's intended experience. Um, I certainly count myself among this uh, user set of where you want exactly how the film was presented. Um, and for those users, uh, we will continue to do traditional codec innovations, producing things that deliver higher, even PSN, PSNR, even though that's a bad metric, but PSNR, SSIM, VMAF, those kinds of fidelity-based metrics. Um, uh, but the other alternative is that for users who don't care, we now have a new platform for making their experience better. And it's not one that we've really explored. Um, we've had a couple talks on it today, actually, or actually yesterday and today, about the idea of uh, understanding the perception of quality um, and of using uh, synthetic, non-fidelity-based approaches to improve video quality, such as resynthesizing the energy spectrum. Um, but uh, I don't, I'm not sure that we've, as a community, like, really focused on this. I've seen research papers on the idea of like, using uh, generative adversarial networks to resynthesize texture details. That stuff has gotten interest. But it's also not what's on top of mind. And I think that in a world where we acknowledge that most users don't really care enough about video quality, at least not enough to spend data bits on it, that those techniques take more prominence. Because then the quality selector, as YouTube has it, where you've got a 480p option and a 1080p option, is not so much about um, whether or not you are willing to have a worse experience or a better one, but more about a potential for an experience where you have a cheaper, lower fidelity, but still high visual quality experience, and then a extremely high fidelity experience um, and that actually benefits the high fidelity users too, because now having a 1080p bit rate that is twice as high will achieve a much higher, you know, lower marginal utility of increasing the bit rate. But that marginal utility is more justified when it's going to only the most discriminating of viewers. So this is a way that actually benefits both sets of users, is understanding that personalization is the angle. Um, and then on top of that, we build two paths, one of, utmost fidelity and another of simply perceptual good enoughness um, that allows more freedom. So this was obviously not a talk about player mechanics, um, but I am uh, uh, willing at this point to take any questions, including about player mechanics, anything in this talk um, or not is fair game because I veered so heavily off of um, the appointed topic. So thanks for listening. I'm sorry that that was so weird. <laughs>